Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Future Wealth Conversations. Today, we're diving into one of the most exciting and important topics for anyone thinking about their financial future, how to retire a millionaire in just 30 years. I'm Sarah, your co-host, and with me, as always, is Alex. Hey Sarah, what's up? Not much. I've been thinking a lot lately about retirement. You know, I keep hearing people say they want to retire a millionaire, but they never seem to have a clear plan. What do you think? Can someone really retire a millionaire in, say, 30 years? Absolutely. It's not just possible. It's doable for most people, assuming they have a clear strategy and are disciplined about it. It doesn't take a genius, but it does take a commitment to good habits, long-term planning, and understanding the power of compound interest. That's a good point. I feel like people underestimate the importance of starting early. I mean, if you wait until you're 40 or 50 to start saving, it becomes so much harder. Exactly. Time is your biggest ally in wealth building. You can use it to your advantage or let it slip by, but starting early gives you more flexibility, less stress, and a much bigger nest egg when you retire. Segment one, the millionaire equation. So, Let's break this down for our listeners. Say someone is in their mid-20s and wants to retire a millionaire in 30 years. What's the basic roadmap? First, we need to define what we mean by a millionaire. For this scenario, let's assume you want a million dollars in today's money, accounting for inflation, taxes, and everything else. The basic math is straightforward. If you can save and invest consistently over 30 years, it becomes much easier to hit that goal. For example, if you want to have $1 million in 30 years and you're earning an average annual return of 7%, which is reasonable if you're investing in a diversified stock portfolio, you'd need to invest around $500 a month. That sounds manageable, but I can already hear some listeners thinking, $500 a month? I don't have that. What would you say to them? I hear that too, and honestly, it's a common feeling. But think of it this way. It's not about depriving yourself. It's about making smarter choices with your money. It could mean cutting back on eating out, reducing subscription services, or even finding ways to increase your income. It's all about priorities. Right. It's like reallocating what you already spend or finding a side hustle to bridge the gap. Small lifestyle adjustments can make a huge difference over time. Exactly. And here's the cool part. Once you start saving and investing, you don't have to rely just on your savings. Compound interest does a lot of the heavy lifting. So, even if you start with a small amount, that money grows exponentially. Uh, yes. Let's talk about compound interest for a minute. For anyone listening who doesn't quite get it, can you explain? Segment 2. The Power of Compound Interest Sure thing. Compound interest is essentially earning interest on your interest. So, the money you initially invest starts to generate returns, and those returns then generate more returns. Over time, this compounding effect makes your money grow faster and faster. For example, let's say you invest $1,000 at a 7% annual return. After one year, you'll have $1,070. In the second year, instead of earning interest only on your initial $1,000, you earn interest on the entire $1,070, and the cycle continues. That's why it's so important to start early, right? The longer your money has to compound, the bigger the impact. Exactly. The earlier you start, the more time you give compound interest to work its magic. The difference between starting at 25 versus 35 is huge. Even if you're only able to save a little at first, the key is consistency. And I think a lot of people misunderstand how the growth curve works. In the first few years, the progress might seem slow, but toward the end of those 30 years, the growth is exponential. Totally. People often quit early because they're not seeing huge gains right away. But if you stick with it, you'll see a snowball effect. The bulk of your gains often happen in the final years because your balance has grown large enough for compound interest to really take off. That's such a good point. Let's shift gears a bit and talk about where people should be putting their money. What are your thoughts on investment strategies for someone aiming to retire a millionaire? Segment three, investment strategies. The first thing is to make sure you're investing in the right vehicles. 
Retirement accounts like 401ks, IRAs, and Roth IRAs are fantastic tools because they offer tax advantages. If your employer offers a match on your 401k contributions, that's free money. So you should max that out first. After that, you can look into other options like brokerage accounts, real estate, and even alternative investments like peer-to-peer -peer lending or crypto, if that's your thing. I agree. But before we dive into all those different vehicles, I think we should emphasize one thing, the importance of diversification. Absolutely. You never want to put all your eggs in one basket. The stock market, for example, historically offers high returns over time, but it can also be volatile in the short term. By diversifying your portfolio across stocks, bonds, real estate, and other assets, you reduce the risk of losing everything in a market downturn. Yeah, and it's also about risk tolerance, right? What might be a good strategy for one person could be too risky for someone else. Exactly. Some people are more comfortable with risk than others, especially when they're younger and have more time to recover from market fluctuations. But as you get closer to retirement, you might want to shift to a more conservative portfolio that includes more bonds and fewer stocks. Oh, right. It's like adjusting the balance based on where you are in life. Let's not forget about the emotional side of investing, though. A lot of people panic when the market dips and they pull out their money at the worst possible time. Yes, that's such a huge mistake. One of the golden rules of investing is to keep a long-term perspective. The market is going to fluctuate, sometimes dramatically, but historically, it's always rebounded. If you pull out in a panic, you're locking in your losses. Segment four, setting financial goals. So let's recap for our listeners. If someone wants to retire a millionaire in 30 years, they need to start early, save consistently, invest in tax-advantaged accounts, and diversify their portfolio. But I think there's another critical piece we haven't touched on yet, setting financial goals. Definitely. Goals give you direction. Without them, it's easy to lose motivation or get distracted. If your goal is to retire a millionaire, you need to break that down into smaller, achievable milestones. Yeah, like setting yearly or even monthly savings targets. That way, you can track your progress and make adjustments if needed. And don't forget about lifestyle goals, too. How much do you want to spend in retirement? What kind of life do you envision for yourself? Once you have a clear picture of that, you can reverse engineer your savings plan to meet those expectations. Exactly. Retirement isn't just about hitting a number. It's about creating the lifestyle you want. If you want to travel the world or buy a second home, your savings target might be higher than someone who wants a more minimalist lifestyle. And while you're saving for retirement, don't forget to enjoy the journey. It's easy to get caught up in accumulating wealth, but balance is key. You don't want to live so frugally that you miss out on life now. Yes. That's something I always remind people. You can be financially responsible while still having fun and enjoying your life along the way. It's all about making smart choices and finding balance. Segment five, avoiding common pitfalls. Before we wrap up, let's talk about some of the common mistakes people make when they're trying to reach that millionaire status. Oh, I've seen plenty of those. One big mistake is lifestyle inflation. As people start earning more, they often increase their spending which means they're saving less. Yep, that's a killer. The key is to live below your means, even as your income grows. If you get a raise, consider saving the extra money instead of spending it. Over time, those savings can really add up. Another mistake I've seen is neglecting emergency funds. People put all their money into investments without having a safety net for unexpected expenses. Then, when an emergency happens, they're forced to pull money out of their investments at the worst time. That's a great point. An emergency fund is essential. You don't want to be stuck selling off investments to cover a car repair or medical bill. A good rule of thumb is to have three to six months worth of living expenses in a liquid, easily accessible account. I'd add one more mistake. Not adjusting your plan as life changes. People get so locked into one strategy that they forget to reassess when they get married have kids, or change jobs. Exactly. Life changes, and your financial plan should evolve with it. 
Don't be afraid to revisit your goals and adjust your savings or investment strategy as needed. Segment six, the role of automation in building wealth. You know, Alex, there's one more thing I think we should talk about when it comes to building wealth over time, automation. We live in a world where technology can make saving and investing so much easier than it used to be. Oh, for sure. Automation is a game changer. One of the hardest things about saving is having to constantly remind yourself to transfer money or invest. But if you automate your savings and investment contributions, you take the decision-making out of the equation. It's like setting yourself up for success by default. Yeah, I've found that when you automate things, you don't even notice the money is gone. It just quietly moves to your retirement account or your investment portfolio, and you get used to living on what's left. What do you suggest people automate first? I'd say start with your retirement contributions. Set up an automatic transfer from your paycheck into your 401k or IRA. Most companies will let you automate your 401k contributions. And for IRAs, it's just a matter of setting up a recurring transfer from your bank account. Then you can automate other investments. If you have a brokerage account, set it to automatically pull a set amount each month and invest in index funds or ETFs. Many platforms make it super easy to set up a recurring investment plan. I love that. And another benefit is that you're able to take advantage of something called dollar cost averaging. Could you explain that for our listeners? Segment seven, the concept of dollar cost averaging. Sure. Dollar cost averaging is a strategy where you invest a fixed amount of money at regular intervals, regardless of what's happening in the market. So instead of trying to time the market, buying when prices are low and selling when they're high, you're just consistently investing. The beauty of this strategy is that you end up buying more shares when prices are low and fewer shares when prices are high, which can lower your average cost per share over time. It's a great way to manage risk because it takes emotion out of the equation. You're not panicking and selling when the market dips. You're continuing to invest. That's such an important point. Timing the market is so difficult even for professional investors. But with dollar cost averaging, you're ensuring that you're always in the game, regardless of what the market is doing. Exactly. The market might go up or down in the short term, but over the long term, it tends to trend upward. By sticking to a consistent investment schedule, you're giving yourself the best chance to benefit from that long-term growth. And it ties back into the idea of discipline. Just like we said earlier, Wealth building is all about consistent habits. Dollar cost averaging forces you to stay consistent, even when the market looks scary. Segment eight, dealing with market volatility. Since we're on the subject of the market, let's talk a little more about market volatility. You and I know that the market goes through ups and downs, but for a lot of people, seeing their portfolio drop is terrifying. What advice do you have for people when the market takes a dive? Oh, this is such an important topic. First off, volatility is normal. The market has always gone through cycles of booms and busts. What's key to remember is that market downturns are temporary, while the long-term trend is growth. The biggest mistake people make is selling in a panic when their portfolio drops. If you pull your money out after a dip, you're locking in your losses which can destroy your long-term returns. It's important to stay calm and remind yourself that this is part of the process. Right. And I think it helps to have an emergency fund, like we mentioned earlier. If you have cash set aside for unexpected expenses, you're less likely to panic and sell your investments when the market drops. Exactly. Having that buffer makes you less emotionally tied to the fluctuations of your portfolio. You can ride out the storm because you know you're not depending on that money in the short term. And for anyone who's tempted to sell when the market goes down, think of it this way. Market drops can actually be a great buying opportunity. Stocks are essentially on sale during a downturn. Totally. That's the mindset shift people need to make. Instead of seeing a market drop as something to fear, see it as a chance to buy great companies at a discount. If you stay invested and even increase your investments during downturns, you'll likely come out ahead when the market rebounds. Segment nine, the importance of financial education. Another thing that's crucial 
especially for someone on the path to becoming a millionaire, is financial education. It's so important to keep learning about money, investments, and how the economy works. What do you think are some good resources for people to start with? Oh, for sure. Financial literacy is key. I'd recommend starting with books like The Simple Path to Wealth by J.L. Collins or The Millionaire Next Door by Thomas Stanley and William Danko. Those are great for building a solid foundation. Podcasts are another awesome resource, like this one. There are tons of great shows out there that break down financial topics in an easy-to-understand way. Choose FI and Bigger Pockets Money are two of my personal favorites. Yeah, I love those. And even things like YouTube channels or finance blogs can be really helpful. The more you immerse yourself in the world of personal finance, the more confident you become in making decisions. Definitely. And it's not just about learning the basics. As you grow your wealth, you'll want to understand more advanced strategies like tax optimization or estate planning. So it's a journey. Start small, but keep expanding your knowledge. I think that's key. A lot of people feel overwhelmed by personal finance because they think they need to know everything up front. But really, it's about taking small steps, learning as you go, and building confidence over time. Exactly. No one becomes an expert overnight. But with a little curiosity and consistent learning, anyone can become financially savvy. Segment 10, Building a Wealth-Building Mindset. So, Alex, let's talk about the mindset piece for a minute. We've covered a lot of practical steps, but having the right mindset is just as important, don't you think? Oh, 100%. Wealth building is as much about mindset as it is about money. It's about having a growth-oriented, long-term perspective. If you view setbacks as opportunities to learn and see wealth building as a journey, you're much more likely to stick with it. Absolutely. A lot of people have limiting beliefs around money, like, I'm just not good with money, or I'll never be rich. Those kinds of beliefs can really hold you back. Yeah, I've heard that too. But the truth is, wealth building is a skill. No one's born knowing how to invest or save effectively. You learn as you go, and the more you practice, the better you get at it. I think a big part of shifting your mindset is surrounding yourself with positive influences. Like, if all your friends are big spenders and don't think about saving, it's hard to stay disciplined. But if you hang out with people who are focused on building wealth, it becomes easier. That's a great point. Your environment shapes your habits. If you're around people who prioritize financial responsibility, that mindset rubs off on you. It's like when you're trying to get healthy. You want to be around people who encourage that lifestyle. Totally. And I think it also helps to celebrate small wins along the way. If you're only focused on hitting that million-dollar mark, it can feel overwhelming. But if you celebrate hitting each milestone, like paying off debt or saving your first $10,000, you stay motivated. Absolutely. Those small victories are so important. They give you momentum and remind you that you're making progress, even if you're still far from the end goal. Segment 11, the impact of inflation. There's one more topic I think we should touch on, especially with all the talk about the economy lately, inflation. How does inflation affect the goal of becoming a millionaire? And what can people do to protect themselves? Great question. Inflation is basically the gradual increase in prices over time and it erodes the purchasing power of your money. So, even if you hit a million dollars in your retirement account, that money won't go as far 30 years from now as it would today. That's why it's important not just to focus on the number itself, but to consider inflation-adjusted returns. You want your investments to outpace inflation so that your wealth actually grows in real terms. Right. So, if inflation averages 2 to 3% per year, your investments need to grow by more than that for you to actually get ahead. Exactly. And that's why investing in assets like stocks, real estate, or other inflation-hedged investments is so important. Cash sitting in a savings account, earning less than the inflation rate, is actually losing value over time. So true. I think a lot of people fall into the trap of hoarding cash because it feels safe, especially during uncertain times. But, like you said, over the long term, inflation erodes the value of that money. 
how can people protect themselves from inflation without taking on too much risk? One of the best ways to protect against inflation is to make sure you're invested in assets that historically outpace it. Stocks are a great option because over the long term, they tend to provide higher returns than inflation. Real estate is another good hedge because property values tend to rise with inflation. And you can also benefit from rental income that adjusts with the cost of living. Another option to consider is Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, or TIPS. They're a type of government bond specifically designed to help protect against inflation because their principal value increases with inflation. I think TIPS are a good option, especially for people who want a more conservative investment strategy but still want to protect against inflation. They don't provide huge returns like stocks do, but they're safe and reliable. Exactly. They won't make you a millionaire on their own, but they can be a good addition to a diversified portfolio, especially as you get closer to retirement and want to reduce your exposure to risk. Diversification is key because different asset classes perform differently depending on what's happening in the economy. Right. And that's another reason why you shouldn't keep everything in cash. Cash loses value to inflation, but if you have a mix of stocks, real estate, and even some bonds or tips, you're spreading out your risk and protecting your purchasing power over the long term. Segment 13, planning for healthcare and long-term costs. Speaking of long-term, there's something else that I think people need to plan for, especially when it comes to retiring in 30 years, health care costs. They're one of the biggest expenses people face in retirement, and they're only going up. That's a huge one. Healthcare costs are often overlooked, but they can be a massive drain on your retirement savings if you're not prepared. Fidelity estimates that the average couple retiring today will need around $300,000 just for healthcare expenses in retirement. And that number doesn't even include long-term care, which can be incredibly expensive. It's crazy when you think about it. And with people living longer, the need for long-term care is growing. How can someone factor that into their retirement plan? One option is to look into long-term care insurance. It's designed to cover the costs of things like nursing homes or in-home care if you need it later in life. It can be pricey, so it's not for everyone. But if you start thinking about it early, like in your 50s or so, you can lock in lower premiums. Another thing to consider is health savings accounts, or HSAs. They're one of the few accounts where you get a triple tax benefit. Your contributions are tax deductible, your investments grow tax-free, and withdrawals are tax-free if used for qualified medical expenses. ACOSH essays are such an underutilized tool. Most people don't even realize that you can invest the money in an HSA, so it can grow over time just like a 401k. You can use it to cover medical costs in retirement or even save it for long-term care. Exactly. And the great thing about HSAs is that the money rolls over every year, so you're not pressured to use it right away. You can let it build up and grow, then use it when you really need it. That's a great strategy. You're essentially building a separate fund for healthcare that can help protect your retirement savings from being drained by medical costs. Segment 14 adjusting for your lifestyle in retirement. So, we've talked about saving, investing, and protecting yourself from inflation and healthcare costs. But I think one more important factor in retiring a millionaire is figuring out what kind of lifestyle you want. A million dollars sounds like a lot, but depending on how you live, it may or may not be enough. Absolutely. Lifestyle plays a huge role in determining how much you really need. Some people want to travel the world, live in luxury, and never work another day in their lives. Others are perfectly happy living a quiet, modest life, maybe working part-time and spending time with family. The key is to define what retirement means for you. Do you want to live off $50,000 a year or $100,000? Do you want to stay in your current city or move somewhere with a lower cost of living? These decisions will influence how much you need to save. And those choices can change over time. Someone might think they want to live large in retirement, but by the time they're 60, they might be more focused on living simply or spending time with loved ones. 
it's important to reassess your goals periodically. Exactly. Retirement is a long time, potentially 20, 30, or even 40 years. Your priorities will evolve, so your financial plan needs to be flexible enough to adjust. That's why it's helpful to have a bit of a buffer in your retirement savings. A million dollars might be your goal, but aiming for a little more can give you that extra peace of mind. I think that's great advice. Plan for the life you want, but also give yourself some room for the unexpected. Because life is full of surprises, good and bad. Segment 15, The Importance of Networking and Mentorship. Alex, before we wrap things up, there's one more topic I want to touch on, networking and mentorship. I think a lot of people underestimate how valuable it can be to have a network of supportive individuals and mentors who can guide them on their financial journey. What are your thoughts on this? Absolutely, Sarah. Networking and mentorship can play a huge role in your financial success. Having a mentor who's been through the process and can offer advice and guidance is incredibly valuable. They can provide you with insights that you might not get from books or online resources. And networking with others who share similar financial goals can be motivating. It's one thing to set a goal on your own, but when you're part of a community that's also focused on building wealth, it can help you stay accountable and inspired. Right. Plus, you never know what opportunities might arise from networking, whether it's learning about a new investment opportunity, getting recommendations for financial advisors, or just sharing strategies. Being connected with like minded individuals can open doors you didn't even know existed. That's a great point. And it doesn't have to be formal networking events either. It could be joining online forums, participating in local financial workshops, or even engaging with social media communities focused on personal finance. Exactly. And don't forget about networking within your own circle. Sometimes the best advice comes from friends or family who have their own experiences with managing money and investing. You can learn a lot from their successes and mistakes. And if you're looking for a mentor, it's worth reaching out to someone you admire in your field or industry. Many people are willing to share their knowledge and experience if you approach them respectfully and show a genuine interest in learning. Segment 16, Evaluating Investment Options. Moving on, let's talk a bit about evaluating different investment options. With so many choices out there, it can be overwhelming to figure out where to put your money. How do you suggest someone go about evaluating different investments? That's a great question. I'd start by considering your investment goals and risk tolerance. Different investments carry different levels of risk and return potential. For instance, stocks generally offer higher potential returns but come with higher volatility, while bonds are more stable but usually offer lower returns. Right. So understanding your own financial goals and how much risk you're comfortable with is crucial. If you're planning for long-term growth and can tolerate some ups and downs, stocks might be a good fit. If you prefer stability and lower risk, bonds or other fixed income investments might be better. Exactly. Another important factor to consider is diversification. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. Diversifying across different asset classes like stocks, bonds, real estate, and even international investments can help spread out risk and improve your overall returns. And don't forget about fees. Different investment options come with different costs, such as management fees for mutual funds or trading fees for individual stocks. Lower fees can mean more of your money is working for you, so it's worth paying attention to. Great point. High fees can eat into your returns over time, so look for investments with reasonable costs. Index funds and ETFs are often good choices because they tend to have lower fees compared to actively managed funds. And remember to periodically review your investment portfolio. As you approach retirement, you might want to shift to a more conservative allocation to protect your gains. Regularly reassessing your investments helps ensure they align with your evolving goals and risk tolerance. Segment 17, the power of compound interest. Let's dive into one more key concept before we finish up. 
compound interest. It's often called the eighth wonder of the world for a reason. Can you explain why compound interest is so powerful? Absolutely. Compound interest is essentially earning interest on your interest. It's a powerful concept because over time, it allows your investments to grow at an accelerating rate. The longer your money is invested, the more it benefits from compound interest. And the key to making compound interest work for you is to start early. Even small contributions can grow significantly over time because you're earning interest on both your initial investment and the interest that has already been added. That's right. For example, if you invest $1,000 at an annual interest rate of 5%, you'll earn $50 in the first year. In the second year, you'll earn interest on the original $1,000 plus the $50 from the first year, so you'll earn $52.50. It doesn't sound like much at first, but over many years, the effects of compounding become substantial. It's really a case of the sooner, the better. Even if you can't save a huge amount at the beginning, starting early gives you more time for your money to grow. That's why even small, consistent investments can add up to a significant amount over 30 years. Exactly. The power of compounding is why it's so important to start investing as early as possible and to keep your money invested for the long term. It's one of the biggest advantages you have in building wealth. Segment 19, final Q and A and listener questions. All right, before we close out, let's tackle a few questions from our listeners. We've got some great ones that came in. Here's the first one. What's the best way to stay motivated when saving for a long-term goal like retirement? Great question. Staying motivated can be challenging, but setting clear, achievable milestones can help. Break down your long-term goal into smaller, manageable steps and celebrate each achievement along the way. It also helps to have a visual reminder of your goal, like a progress chart or a vision board. I love that idea. And regularly reviewing your progress and adjusting your plan as needed can keep you engaged. Remember, the journey is just as important as the destination. Absolutely. And having a strong support network, like friends or a financial advisor, can help keep you accountable and motivated. Here's another question. How can I start investing if I don't have a lot of money to begin with? Starting with small amounts is perfectly fine. Many investment platforms allow you to start with as little as $100. Consider using low-cost index funds or ETFs, which don't require a large initial investment. Also, look for platforms with no minimum balance requirements or commission-free trades. And don't forget about using investment apps that offer features like automatic roundups or small recurring investments. They make it easy to start investing with minimal amounts. Exactly. The important thing is to get started and build the habit of investing regularly. Over time, even small contributions can grow significantly. Great answers, Alex. And thank you to our listeners for your fantastic questions. Well, that's it for today's episode of Future Wealth Conversations. We hope you found our discussion on retiring a millionaire in 30 years, both informative and inspiring. Thanks for joining us. Remember, the journey to financial independence is a marathon, not a sprint. Stay disciplined, keep learning, and don't be afraid to seek out support and mentorship along the way. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. And if you have any more questions or topics you'd like us to cover, reach out to us on social media or drop us an email. We look forward to having you join us for our next episode. Until then, take care and keep working towards your financial goals. Happy saving, everyone.